Hello, and welcome to the program. My name is Sam Angerson. I'm the director of the Billy Matthews National Shell Museum, and we're glad you have joined us for Dr. John Pfeiffer's talk, The Secret and Endangered Lives of Freshwater Mussels. And we appreciate John taking time out uh, to, uh, to give us this program this evening. And we're also glad for the topic for those of you who uh, who may tune in to, to our other lectures. Last month, we were joined by Nori Young from the Bishop Museum in Hawaii, where she gave a, a great presentation on uh, land snails of Hawaii. And for um, it's, it's meaningful for us here in, uh, at the Shell Museum and in Florida, because we find often that a lot of, uh, a lot of our visitors, a lot of the general public, when they're thinking of mollusks, uh, often it's uh, it's you know saltwater marine mollusks that that leap to mind and and sort of control the conversation and so to be able to have these programs on on land mollusks and and freshwater species uh, we're glad to be able to uh, um, have experts in those areas um, um, join us and and give us these programs. Um, so this lecture will be will be recorded as they all are and so if you'd like to see it uh, at a future time or or share it with someone you can visit the museum's website shellmuseum.org and go to the education section under lectures and you'll find it there along with an archive of all of the online lectures we've had going back a couple of years now there are over 20 and you can also, while there on that same page, you can register for two upcoming online lectures, which um, we've got one next month on uh, September 14th. Actually, I'll, I'll be the speaker for that one. It's uh, September 14th comes about two weeks, well, exactly two weeks before the one year anniversary of Hurricane Ian. Which which hit the museum and this and this whole area of Southwest Florida so hard, and it will be a talk about uh, renewal and what uh, what it was what it was what it was like following the storm, but also what our path has been since, and also quite a bit about what we're looking ahead to for the future, which include uh, which includes we think some some quite exciting. Uh, changes and improvements for the museum. So that's on September 14th. And then on October 12th, uh, the Shell Museum's own science director and curator, Jose Leal, will give a program called the Charisma of Cowries. So both of those are, are free. And again, it's shellmuseum.org for education and then lectures. And you can register for those and you can browse any of our, any of our past lectures. The uh, we'll do questions and answers for John's talk uh, following his his presentation and to to participate in that. Uh, this is a webinar format, so use the chat function, please, to type in your questions and you scroll along the top or or bottom of your screen to to find that chat icon and type in your question and uh, you type type in the question at, at any time. And we'll keep track of them. And after after the presentation, we'll uh, we'll get to your questions and answers. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. John Pfeiffer, who is curator of Bivalvia, which is, by the way, I think one of the coolest titles out there, curator of Bivalvia, and also a research zoologist at the Smithsonian. Um, Institution National Museum of Natural History. He's been there for about four years. His research has uh, a special focus, as um, as we might imagine, on freshwater mussels, and he does great work. And uh, he earned his PhD in zoology uh, from the University of Florida. So, John, thank you again for for making time and and um, and and pairing this program for for Shell Museum audience and. Um, and the, the virtual stage is, is yours. Sam, thanks for the introduction. Very kind words, I appreciate you. And um, thank you all for, for being here. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about um, my 
Uh, favorite group of bivalves, you know, they probably fly under the radar, but I think that kind of unassuming um, vibe lends themselves well to kind of blowing the minds of people when they start to really understand these animals. Um, and I like to think of them as one of biodiversity's best kept secrets. So I hope that I can um, communicate that to you. So this group um, is the freshwater mussels. It's an ancient lineage, like over 200 million years old, and it's the most successful freshwater bivalve um, radiation. There's like a thousand species and they're distributed worldwide on every continent except for Antarctica. And they come in a variety of different shapes and sizes and colors and textures. And they really are a uh, morphologically diverse group. Um, but their shells may not be the most diverse or uh, amazing aspect of their uh, biodiversity. And, and I tend to think that their, their behavioral uh, biodiversity, their behavior, the complexity of their behavior is perhaps the most amazing. And, you know, when you think of a, a bivalve, you probably, the first words that come to mind are not, you know, uh, behavioral complexity. <laughs> the, the first words that come to mind maybe are brown or, or round, <laughs> um, but they, they really are behaviorally complex animals. And I like to try and introduce this idea by asking a seemingly unrelated question. And that question is, how many fish do you see in this image? Um, so take a look around and try and count how many fish you see in here. Um, and so if you said four, four is the right wrong answer. Um, because this fourth fish here in the top center isn't a fish at all. It is a freshwater mussel mimicking a fish. So I'll try and walk you through this. Here's the shell, you know, the, the bivalve is sitting in the rocks with its, with its anterior end, the bottom half buried in the rocks and its top, end, top half sitting uh, in, in the, the in the, the stream bed. And so here's the shell margin and up here are the siphons, you know, the, or the apertures that are used to, for filter feeding. And the same tissues that uh, are used to make these siphons, apertures have been, uh, has been modified here to resemble uh, a freshwater fish. And, you know, it's complete with an eye spot this modeled patterning and this fleshy, you know, fin-shaped structures. And I mean, it, it's a remarkably good uh, mimic, but, but, but nevertheless, why, why, why would a mussel build a fish on its back? And it does that because hidden behind this mimic are hundreds or, or thousands, hundreds of thousands or thousands of parasitic larvae. And these larvae are called, for the, for the sake of this conversation, they're called glochidia. And these are freshwater mussel larvae. And these glochidia, these larvae are parasitic and they have to live on the gills and fins of a fish to complete metamorphosis to a juvenile and then eventually uh, an adult mussel. So this is an obligate parasitic relationship that all freshwater mussels uh, undertake to complete their life cycle. Just like a, a, a butterfly has to go into a chrysalis or a caterpillar has to go into a chrysalis to become a butterfly, mussels have a similar type of, uh, of metamorphosis that requires these parasitic larvae attaching to the gills and fins of a fish. So mussels do this, it's, this phenomenon is called phagomimicry or mimicking the food items of their host. So these, these fish serve as hosts for the mussels. And in order to increase the chances of this parasitic uh, interaction, they lure 
their their uh, hosts to 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 closer to their larvae. They are literally going fishing by using lures. So the fish will uh, see what it thinks is lunch, and it'll swim down and it'll try and bite this lure. And instead of getting lunch, it just gets a bunch of parasitic larvae. And those muscle, those parasitic larvae live on the gills and fins of the fish for a couple of weeks, a month, and then they drop off and, and turn into juvenile and eventually adult freshwater mussels. Um, and they have evolved an amazing array of adaptations to trick their, their host fish. So this is a, a fish mimic. Here's another fish mimic. Um, and not only do they mimic the morphology of their host's favorite prey item, they oftentimes mimic their host's prey item's behavior with this flicking motion that um, you can imagine would an elicit response from a predator. And you can see like this kind of air mattress like structure back here. This is just packed full of those parasitic larvae. And when a fish tries to eat this lure, that air mattress gets ruptured and releases all of these parasitic larvae. So here's a fish mimic. Here's a crayfish mimic. It's complete with, you know, that black beady eye, all of these appendages on the abdomen, and then this large tail-like structure. And if you've ever seen like a shrimp or uh, a crayfish or a lobster like move away really quickly, they kind of have like this uh, backwards, this characteristic backwards swimming motion that they use like this tail clapping. Um, and this muscle is going to mimic that that behavior. So this is blurry, but once I hit play, it'll become more clear. So here's the muscle, you know, kind of sitting halfway in the substrate, and here's the tail and these appendages on, on the um, abdomen. And so this muscle will um, mimic this backward swimming motion of, of, a, of a crayfish. And it's just <laughs> uh, re really amazing that uh, this muscle has no eyes. It has no idea what a, a crayfish is, but it can mimic its morphology and the behavior of a crayfish. And it's truly remarkable evolutionary adaptation and is why I started studying freshwater mussels. Um, so there's a crayfish mimic. There's also aquatic insect mimic. So this is a black fly pupa. And this muscle will release all of these little packages. And when you zoom in on these packages, they look more like a black fly pupa than a black fly pupa. They have this kind of, you know, corrugated structure and these big black eyes and these kind of antenna structure. And inside each of these packages are thousands of glycidia. So when a small fish comes by and tries to eat what it thinks is a black fly pupa, it just gets a bunch of parasitic larvae. And this is probably the, the most dramatic. This whole group is known as the darter snappers and they physically capture their hosts between their valves and the edges, uh, the edges of their shells have been modified with these teeth that are used to, to trap their, their host fish. And you can see all of these glycidia, all these larvae, just kind of all over uh, the fish, just covering the fish in the, these um, parasitic larvae. And so this, this type of interaction, this, this type of parasitism has been happening for 200 million years in the lakes and rivers and streams uh, across the world. And it has been an important phenomenon shaping the evolution and ecology of, of freshwater ecosystems um, acro across the, the planet. Um, unfortunately, these interactions are becoming less common because muscle diversity and abundance is declining uh, across the world and particularly well known in the United States. They're frequently referred to as some of the most endangered animals in the world. So there's about 300 species in the US. And in the past 200 years, 
approximately 30 species have gone totally extinct. That's 10% of the regional diversity is, is already gone. And many other species um, have protection under state and federal laws. Um, the, the most uh, important, probably most important of which is the Endangered Species Act, whose primary objective is to protect imperial species from extinction. So there's about 1300 animals on the endangered species list. 90 of those animals belong to this one group of, of freshwater mussels. So there's about 300 species, 90 of them are federally listed. So that is like one out of every three freshwater mussels are approaching the brink of extinction to the point where the federal government has uh, enacted laws to, to protect them. Um, but these, but translating this protection into recovery is, is really complicated by this parasitic relationship, as you can imagine. Um, it, it's difficult to uh, conserve these animals because they have this um, unique and, and complex parasitic relationship on freshwater fishes. Um, so one of the ways that uh, the freshwater mussel conservation community has used to, to, to conserve freshwater mussels is to essentially create freshwater mussel farms or, or use you know versions of, of aquaculture to to breed freshwater mussels so that they can be used to augment um, existing populations to add individuals to existing populations or introduce uh, species into rivers in, in which they used to occur. Um, and these facilities are littered across the US. There's well over a dozen now. And their, their, uh, their primary objective is, is to create like a, a Noah's Ark for freshwater mussels. And they're, they're, they're breeding um, mussels using various different techniques. And then they grow them out until they're a suitable size where they can be um, released back into the river. And this has been an extremely um, successful approach for, for many species and maybe not so much for other species, but it is a, um, a really useful measure that we can take to, to protect freshwater mussel biodiversity from, from going extinct. And um, these are the, the, you know, kind of the people in the rivers making a big difference in terms of freshwater mussel conservation. And um, it's really great to have them as part of the, the freshwater mussel community. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and um, focus on some of the, the scientific imaging we're doing on freshwater mussels here at the Smithsonian and at other um, partnering institutions, especially the, the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. Um, so I wanna talk about briefly introduce just three or introduce three um, kind of projects we're starting to get off the ground. The first of which is creating um, a taxonomically comprehensive 3D library of all the freshwater mussel species in the United States. And to do this, we're um, using this approach called photogrammetry, which just takes a, a series of cameras and takes thousands of, you know, standard two-dimensional pictures. And it takes a picture and then this disc rotates and it takes another picture with the three cameras. So it takes, you know, hundreds or thousands of 2D images and then it stitches them all together to create these 3D uh, reconstructions. So these constructions are working out really well for uh, freshwater mussels. This is a beautiful specimen from the Smithsonian. Its common name is called the rabbit's foot. You can kind of see the resemblance. And these reconstructions can be manipulated in, in three dimensions and zoomed in on and um, so we've been, this project was funded by, in, in large part by the um, US Fish and Wildlife Service and their National Conservation Training Center, which their primary objective is to train the, the next generation of conservation biologists. 
And um, they wanted this taxonomically comprehensive 3D library uh, of freshwater mussels so they could use it as um, education outreach and particularly training um, so that individuals can, can view these really rare specimens or, or extinct species and familiarize themselves with um, their morphological diversity. Because it's difficult to, 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 for some of these species to find specimens that are suitable for training purposes. So this is the next best alternative to, um, to having the actual specimen. And these can be um, 3D printed and in color and by scale. And um, the replicas are really excellent and they're well suited for handling and, and education and outreach and it's something we're, we're really excited about. So right now, the, we have this temporary uh, repository of about 100 of the 300 species. And eventually, you'll be able to go here. And these are all open access. You can download them and use them or print them however you'd like and compare them side by side. Um, and yeah, we're, we're really looking forward. This will be an excellent resource, resource for us to, um, to, to help uh, for training and teaching purposes. The next um, project I wanted to talk about was creating this 3D anatomical atlas for global freshwater mussels. And so this, the idea is to use um, CT scanning like um, you, you would get in the hospital to, to, to look at your brain. But instead of, uh, we're gonna look at something a little bit more interesting and we're gonna look at some freshwater mussel CT scans. <laughs> and um, the objective here is, is to do this for, a couple of representatives of all of the major lineages of freshwater mussels. Um, so we can take these CT scans of different mussels, and this is a non-destructive method, just like a, a CT scan would be in, in the hospital. They might be able to do the same thing by dissecting your brain, but of course they wouldn't want to do that. And for some specimens, we don't want to um, da damage them or you know do any type of destructive sampling. So we can use these CD scans to digitally dissect these animals and segment out different organ systems or muscles. So this is just comparing, you know, here's the digestive system of three different species, um, their nervous system, their pericardium. So we can use this kind of digital dissection to, to, to better understand uh, muscle, uh, muscle anatomy. Um, and another kind of fun aspect of this, this is we oftentimes find various like symbionts in the muscles. So like here you can see, um, or just maybe not symbionts, but just critters that happen to be inside the muscle. <laughs> um, so here's, here's a leech that was scanned. We found inside a scanned individual. And here's a parasitic mite. These mites actually parasitize freshwater muscles. And maybe my favorite example, and this is a bit of a tangent, so excuse me, but we were talking about how um, mussels are parasites of fish to, to reproduce. This, uh, this group of fishes, they're called the bitterlings, they have uh, evolved a, a kind of similar but opposite pattern where in order for them to reproduce, they have to parasitize a mussel. So this is the female and she'll take this long ovipositor and she'll put it down into the muscle's aperture and it'll, she will lay her eggs inside the muscle. The male will come over and release his gametes over the incurrent aperture and it, the muscle will filter in the gametes. So the fish fertilization occurs inside the muscle. And this is where the larval fishes develop. And you can see this in the scan. Here's some, you know, really uh, some some individuals very early in development that have this really yolky, uh, and whatever, they're, they're just essentially eggs are very early in development, where these individuals are much, uh, uh, much later in their development. And so without damaging the specimen, we can start to, to look at how these individuals are distributed across the inner or an outer gills without ever uh, damaging these sensitive specimens. And um, 
the last little bit I'll talk about is this very recent, we just started production on this like uh, seven weeks ago or something, but we're doing a mass 2D imaging of our the entirety of our freshwater mussel collection here um, at the Smithsonian. So our objective is to image um, at, a representative of all 25,000 records. So we have 25,000 lots of freshwater mussels. And so for each record or lot, we're going to image up to three individuals. And then for each individual, we're going to do three views per specimen, um, an external view, an internal view, and uh, a dorsal view. So we're expecting well over probably 120,000 images. So we have 10,000 images right now, and they started production like seven or eight weeks ago. So we're really making um, quite a lot of progress, and um, it's a really exciting project. And um, um, this will make our collection much, much more accessible. Um, and it, I'll talk now about um, its kind of research application. So we're hoping to use um, computer vision, machine learning, and morphometrics to better understand how shell size, color, and shape varies within and between species, as well as their relationship with the environment and their evolutionary history. So the, the basic premise is to, to, to take these images and train a machine learning algorithm to, to recognize these shells um, from other parts of the images, image, and create a mask, create, create an object that has um, just two pixel types, you know, uh, a shell pixel type and a non-shell pixel type. And once we have these kind of binarized objects, we can start to, uh, uh, this, this is a machine readable object, so we can start using computer software to ingest these images and um, come up with a, have a numerical framework to, to quantify um, shell shape. So this is just a panel of um, 1300 images from this one genus and the colors represent the different um, species. And with this information, we can start using other software to start looking at how variation how how these how these um, shapes vary um, across biodiversity and, and environment and it's a really exciting project that we're hopeful will be helpful in um, better understanding species boundaries in the group and just before I wrap up I'd like to um, thank um, all my collaborators on each of these projects, as well as the funders, especially the Smithsonian and the National Museum of Natural History, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, and also thanks to all of you for your attention, and I'm happy to take um, any questions. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you for a great presentation and your your research is is fascinating um so we have I, I have a couple questions but i know there are some here in the chat and i will pull those up first all right kimberly has a question can you please explain the difference between saltwater and freshwater mussels yeah, so um, it's they're very, very distantly related animals, as as you might imagine. Um, and the common name kind of makes you want to associate um, them with each other, but they are are very different um, evolutionarily. And so, um, you know, like marine mussels do not have any type of parasitic stage. So the thing that distinguishes freshwater mussels from all other bivalves is this uh, larval parasitism. So um, I would say that's the, 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 the primary way you would separate marine mussels from, from freshwater and, and not living in the same ecosystem, yeah. 
So I'll, I'll insert one of my own questions right now. So the the statistics you had on um, decline of species and the the danger that fresh mussel, freshwater mussels are in is quite quite compelling. What are what are the primary drivers in in that decline? Is it polluted waterways? Is it um, other factors? Yeah, as you might imagine, it's a, a myriad of different factors. Um, one that is not uh, that is that is really um, problematic in freshwater ecosystems, not just for mussels, but lots of freshwater biodiversity, is, is uh, damming. So they're like because um, most of these animals are adapted to you know moving water, and once you put a, a, a dam in. It, it totally eliminates all of that riverine habitat and essentially converts it to a lake where a mm -hmm. lot of these animals um, are not adapted to. And if these animals are only distributed in a small area, essentially one dam or a series of dam can eliminate all of the available habitat for that species. And in many cases, um, these species extinctions can be attributed to to, to dam building, um, right. so that's kind of like and then yeah of, of uh, um, another a variety of other habitat types habitat degradation like water extraction water pollution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right, mm -hmm. let's look. Um, Alan asked, "Is there host?" specificity by the fish does a single fish species only do one clam species yeah um it's a great question thanks um there is a, a gradient um so some mussel species only use a single host a single fish species and we would call them a host specialist but then on the other end of the spectrum there's a mussel species that can use like 12 different families of freshwater fish. So they are a host generalist. And um, there's pretty much everything in, in between. So you can imagine like on so, with uh, some of those videos or pictures I showed that the ones with these really specific or type of lures um, use fewer hosts than an a uh, mussel that simply or more simply releases its glycidia into the water column kind of more indiscriminately. So mm. yeah, there, there's a lot of variation in host specificity. Mm. All right. Thank you, Alan. Nancy asks, how soon will the databases be available to the public? I'm an archaeologist studying prehistoric freshwater shell midden sites. Oh, awesome. Yeah, they, um, we will be updating. So we're kind of kicking the, the 2D, um, the, the 2D project off now, and we haven't um, pushed any of the data to be publicly available yet, but we're going to be doing that periodically. So um, feel, feel free to, to, to contact me and, with, and I, I can send some updates. And then the, um, the 3D, um uh, the, the photogrammetry reconstructions those are available now and i think they're we're gonna have a press release on it soon um so that'll make the the website more visible um and it's just a temporary rep rep repository so it it's in, in the works so stay tuned sorry to be vague but that's kind of where it's at right now <laughs> yeah no i hear you Kathy has a question. Um, uh, quite unique as bivalves. Does the host die ever? How how do the mussels up in the northern hemisphere handle the freezing water temps? Yeah. So um, typically, the 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 mussels don't um, have a severe negative impact on the hosts. Right. You can imagine if if your life depends on this fish, you don't want to kill it. Right. So so most parasites, oftentimes parasites don't kill their hosts. They just kind of negatively affect it. 
but it's probably more annoying than it is. It's, it's definitely more annoying than lethal. If you had something, if you had a Pac-Man living on your lungs, you would kind of be uh, annoyed too, I imagine. And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of, it's probably more respiratory um, than, than lethal. And, and then the second part was, oh, um, in the the northern hemisphere so yeah mussels can live in, in in really high latitudes and if um some species will migrate vertically in the the water column so we'll just move further down uh into the into the mud and they tend to not stay really close to the shoreline during the winter when the the water has a tendency to, to turn into hard water so um, yeah all right rich has a question what are what are some impactful ways public aquarium facilities can contribute to conservation efforts supporting freshwater mussels oh boy good um, question <laughs> yeah i i wish i had a a really good answer you know there's just so many uh factors causing um muscle decline i education right i mean it starts I hate there to, uh, yeah sound cliche but i think that you know um outreach and education has has a a, a really strong or has a lot of potential you know it, it seems really easy to be dismissive of freshwater mussels when you know absolutely nothing about them um so kind of trying to to make the animals resonate with people i think go, goes a long way right. um, so the ex the examples you showed in your presentation of uh of the facilities that are farming mussels right yeah um are those do you know if, are they what are the affiliations that those you know that they have you know are they affiliated with universities or with um are they private enterprises or I don't know, do you know? Yeah, it, it kind of runs the gamut. There are some academic, you know, based uh, facilities. Many of them are like federal hatcheries um, or, or state hatcheries. And um, I know they oftentimes have events and, and things to show, um, to show the public of, of what they're doing and, and releasing muscles back into the wild. And so I think um I think what you're alluding to, Sam, is to to, to working with your every state has essentially every state has a, a a malacologist and a lot of their like state uh game agencies mm -hmm. frequently yeah. a uh, a state malacologist in part because muscles are super endangered. And they're frequently looking for for help and assistance. And in my experience, they've been very um, generous with their time. And um, so that could be another opportunity as well. Yeah. Well, our museum as a small aquarium will be um, will certainly be working on on the education front to uh, to get the message out about conservation of these these animals. Um, Barbara asks, what does the early larval stage look like? Can you show a microscopic photo of one? Well, I don't know if we can show a microscopic photo of one right at the moment, but. <laughs> um, they they can be quite variable, um, but they look like little Pac-Man and they tend to be like um, 100 to 300 microns. Uh, so they are, you know, visible with the with the the naked eye, but they look like, um, yeah, just miniaturized bivalves. They instead of having typically bivalves have the the two um, adductor muscles. The glochidia just have the single one, um, but they can be, you know, triangular shaped or axe head shaped or circular or oval and. Um, yeah, they can be um, pretty variable, but more or less like a Pac-Man. Barbara has a couple more questions. Uh, the support hatcheries, 
with like the ones you show were on the Midwest, East Coast. So there's two questions. One, are there any facilities on the West Coast? And then also, what is the lifespan of freshwater mussels? Um, yes, they, they very much are mostly on the East Coast. That's where the vast majority of freshwater mussel diversity is in the U.S. I think there's like 270 species on the East Coast, and then maybe only like a dozen uh, uh, west of the Rockies. So the, the species diversity is a lot uh, less west of the Rockies, but there's definitely efforts um, in the West Coast that uh, use propagation. And there's um, some really excellent facilities like the uh, Umatilla tribe. They have an excellent um, freshwater mussel propagation facility and they're working to conserve the mussels in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so yeah, you, uh, you, might, you might look into that. And then the, the lifespan can be quite variable, you know, like, um, from like five years it would be a really, really short lived species. And then a hundred years for a long lived species in like Northern latitudes, um, maybe average around 20 or 30 or something. That's like long. That. I don't know why that surprises me, but that's long. That seems, that seems long. Yeah, I mean, it's a... like, uh, yeah, that, that's a long lived invertebrate. Yeah. Mm. Um, all right, Janet asks, in general, what is the benefit of mussels to freshwater rivers? Um, yeah, so th they're often times referred to as ecosystem engineers, just like a, an oyster bed, you know, might ha has dramatic effects on, on the, the surrounding ecosystem. Mussels live in these really dense aggregates too, and they are constantly filter feeding. And so they are provide many ecosystem services, in particular water filtrates, and you know they have the potential to really influence water clarity and, and chemistry. Um, and they also provide food for many different animals, like mm. mammals and and, and fish. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that they have ha uh, have a lot of ecosystem services. Yeah. Okay. All right, John. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, audience, for your terrific questions and for tuning in. And um, and yeah, John. Thank you again for for being with us for this program and and illuminating us on this uh, on this great great subset of the molluscan world. So, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm dropping in the uh, the link to this is a temporary link, but you, you can use it now to explore. This is of the the 3D models that um, I was showing. So you can use that link to. Um, OK, so that's it. That. Cool. So that's going in what the chat or where's that going? Oh, yeah. I, um, yeah. yeah, it says host and panelists. Yeah. So I think yeah. everyone should be able to see the link now. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, folks, if you can't get in touch with me, I think a lot of you know how to get in touch with me and we can, um, uh, we can share that link with you. So, all right. Thank you. Yeah. You have a good evening, John, and a uh, good rest of your day to everyone else who is out there. All right. Okay. Thanks everyone for your time. Appreciate you. Ciao. Thank you.